Today is the World of Rugby Day. That's such important things for um, workers. <laughs> First of all, it's me because of myself. I would like to put out, you know, our, you know, whole community around the world, um, and also Tibetans. They're really close to our heart. And um, a Falun Gong followers, and there's so many um, church based organizations and the members. And the, wherever they are, they always reach out to us um, just seeking help, and as well as really uh, keen to work um, on the frontier. And so I really do appreciate it. It's, uh, it's not only just the one religion or one a particular community, and we're pretty much covering all aspects. And especially thanks for Leah. <laughs> you actually reduced a lot of pressure from me and I wasn't going to how I explain the torture side of the business and uh, Leah pretty much covered so I don't have to do that part of work. Thanks. Um, speaking of, um, I didn't create such a beautiful PowerPoint and I saw this conference and it was told me like the very last minute so I kind of write it up what I can and end up still setting pages, but I'm not going to read through all setting pages. I just go through the topic, the main views, and how I see, and I believe my paper is on the booklet. So, yeah, if you are interested and you really want to sit down and have a coffee reading time, please go for it. Um, before I go through my uh, the presentation, there's two things from last week really stands out. I don't know how much you are actually interested in or following outcome issues. Um, this is a mass concentration, um, you know, mass detention and plus um, the concentration camps and inside of China. Um, the one is after the Hong Kong rally, um, you know, BBC actually interviewed um, Chinese ambassador to UK, uh, Liu Xiaoli, and he's the message was very, very patriotic, but interesting, and he was completely denying the existence of concentration camp. And so where did you get your one million number? Yet they still fall behind international investigation. We are no longer talking about one million anymore because the numbers are escalating, more and more evidence coming out. We are talking about the camp itself is a three million, over three million. Besides that, Leo already mentioned there's eight different types of um, prison and the detention centers and the camp. That's three different type categories. And we're talking about there's almost a two to three million people also kept in detention centers without any charge. Then we have a prison system. What's happening at the moment is we're not actually talking about regular judicial system here. When they start sentencing, they bring 50 to 100 people in the same room giving one sentence. They categorize people. People who sentence between 3 to 12 months, one category. Roughly about 50 people, given sentence, taken out. Then there's a 12 months to three years as another category. Then three years up to six years is another category. So they divide the category by category. They don't say it is one by one, it's by group. So you can see this whole Chinese uh, judicial system is how chaotic. They can't keep up with sentencing any longer. So that's why they want to reduce the stress pressure from camp. They're removing people from camp and the detention of over to prison system. Now, I think if you really look into um, some really good studies from ASPI, uh, Australian Security um, the Institute, it's uh, part of the defense research. They come up with a brilliant map and they map the existing, or rather we can see with eyes, with a satellite image, about 28 concentration camps, they put on the uh, internet, the website, they create this very interesting interactive map. If any one of you here, if you have any information about the number 29, you can actually enter that information into this map. Very interactive. 
But in our research, our investigation within our community, we're not talking about 28 camps here. There's just so many camps actually on the ground. And also they moved the neighboring province, so like a Gansu, Ninja. And the, the camps on the net, we're talking about capacity function 50,000, almost like a small city we're talking. In, in Chinese standard, that's a small city. And in international standard, and especially I, I came from Australia, 150,000 quite decent million size city in our standard. So if you think about it, one camp can you know, can you know, sustain 150,000 people. Can you imagine how many people have to work in that center? And can you imagine the kids involved? And can you imagine the food, water, the sanitation, hospital, all other facilities has, has to come along. So it's, it's, this is not something like a simple uh, operational, simple exercise we talk about. This is military exercise. If you don't mobilize at least about 50,000 people, you cannot manage that 150,000 people. If you mobilize 50,000 people, adults, and how about their families? So that's why they're building another brand new city in the middle of nowhere. So that's actually, once again, that's another image. Uh, recently, they did discover in Gansu, but having, I don't think it was actually managed to put an article into existing database. So this is kind of the recent, um, very latest development in, uh, situation. Now, despite all of that, we, I, I've been battling with the UN uh, Human Rights Commission and as well as a few other departments for quite some time, trying to get their attention. And um, the, the counter-terrorism uh, Deputy Secretary Vladimir Volkov, he decided to go to China. And uh, that didn't go too well. And everyone out crying, criticizing. Yet when they come back, the counter-terrorism um, commission put up a little press release. It's absolutely soft. Literally nothing you can pick up from that piece of paper. But once again, UN really did let us down. And um, we are um, very disappointed. And uh, as well as um, we don't know yet where it's going to go, the way it's UN actually, the handling current situation. Um, but we are still intent to work with the different countries and within the UN how we can actually regenerate that uh, little power, collaborative you know, uh, response rather than just any one country or one, you know, this um, international governing system which is UN. We UN is not too long right now. So if I if you look at my um, the paper, there's a couple of things. It's a who, who are we? The why, why China is so interested in trying to get rid of us? And that they keep using the same word over and over again, final solution. When, when did you hear that final solution? It's in the movie. That was in the Second World War, that final solution, that notion come up, pop up. But China, when they're talking, when they're handling, the Uyghur population, along with other Muslims in the northwest corner of China, that's what they're using. If they call this is our final solution. From whatever is the definition of final solution, more and more, when we look at the evidence we gathered, it is actually systemic genocide. And um, I put it out about 14, the fact, why do we classify this as systemic genocide? It has actually kick-started 20 years ago, no one noticed. And it was developed so sustainably, it's so steady, so gradual, and so slow as well. And eventually intensified start from 2016. Until then, no one actually really paying attention what was going on on the ground. So we are, Turkey language speaking people and our population, based on our own scholars, we roughly about 20 million people inside China. And other than 20 million, we have another nearly 4 million people in Central Asia, right across five states. And we also have about another five to 6,000 uh, people 
and in different countries in Europe, we have another roughly about 5,000 population living in Australia, and we have just about over 8,000 in the United States. And we, raised the um, data shows roughly about 60,000 of the population living in Turkey. So we're not talking about very small numbers of people here. It's quite large, a decent numbers. Australian population is 23 million. So we are talking about one country's population here. Um, so it's not like a simply trying to get rid of 100 or 200 people. It's sort of trying to diminish roughly about 23 to 24 million people. That's not small numbers. Um, so we actually uh, experienced twice in the history our own independence. Once as 1973, and the second time around we tried, that was 1944. Um, China Communist Party managed to get and um, signed the Yalta Agreement. That was 1949. Then, pretty much, agreed to give us our term of uh, It was given in 1954. So, we officially we've been taken or merged into um, current Chinese territory. Um, that was agreement between China and Russia at the time. Now, if we uh, look at our geopolitics, um, it, it, it's a we are, in a way, is a Chinese frontier. If they wanted to get access to Central Asia and beyond, and as well as Europe. So we sit in a very critical, important corridor. We're also providing this pathway for China to move their economy, military influence, and as well as their expansion from where they are now to move into Caspian Sea, Central Asia, and as well as Europe. And once they go into Central Asia and Europe, there's another, you know, if you look at um, the Belt and Road Initiative, they're going through sea, already expanded to uh, Africa. So very much they managed to cover three continents in the one go. So that's why it's our position, um, geopolitically, we are very critical. And if um, they constantly see that little disagreement or unhappiness or un um, unstable situation in that corner, China will not be quite happy to expend, spend so much money, doing so much infrastructure, trying to push out, yet leaving that really sensitive, yet um, unstable situation behind it, which is looking at us as their enemies. So first of all, they have to do one for all, get rid of people, absolutely push them down to the ground, managing um, the making sure they never uh, you know raise again. So that's what's happening right now. And um, if I look at the few factors I put it in, from 2016 onwards, um, that's when uh, Belt and Road Initiative became really intensified, pretty much expanded to uh, roughly about 40 countries. They start signing the agreement and all of that. At the same time, what's happening to us is current Xinjiang is completely cut off from outside. And we, as a living in the diaspora, we cannot communicate with our family any longer. Prior to that, what was happening was every phone call we made to our family Every email that we sent, or every even WeChat, the message we sent, all everything is monitored. And if I read my parents at today and I spoke to them, and we actually very careful until 2016, very careful what we say, very careful with we're making sure we don't put our family at risk. But that's why there's no way there we will be talking anything politically sensitive topic. Even with that, and our family is still not safe. And if I talk something today, tomorrow, the local police will visit my home and ask my parents. And we, you know, so so you have spoken to your daughter yesterday, and this is this, this discuss. Um, and I think 
We have already told you so many times, and we need to reduce the numbers of phone calls you are receiving from overseas. Unfortunately, we have three out of our five kids in my family, we, we live in overseas. And if you in parents, if me, I'm ringing, and my other two siblings, like they're literally receiving three phone calls in a week, which is immediately put my family at risk. I'm talking just only about one family story here. Like myself, there's so many stories right across the region. So what China did, eventually brilliantly, come up with the one, like a blank policy. If you're receiving phone calls from your family, if you answer that phone call, you will be in the camp. That's what's happened. It's very simple, just by receiving one phone call. I personally, my two sisters, they're in and out, in and out, camp three times already, by me speaking out. And we tried everything, trying to sustain the calm situation at the time, didn't work. And many families, after the situation, even worse than that, we, yes, managed to bring them out, but so many of them, family members, they went in and never came out. And then, the situation only got worse. They come to the term, Chinese authority not even, didn't get shy to bring us overseas, directly from Uruchi, threatening us. So that's what we're talking about is, we no longer bad at Chinese citizens. They're quite happy to put pressure on Australian citizens. That this is extrajudicial. This went beyond their border. They knew this is wrong, but they're still doing it. They're threatening. They're reaching out their arm so far. Not only Australia. We have families in Europe. We have family in the United States. They receive the same phone calls directly from national uh, Chinese public security personnel. This is how far they went before it's come to where we are now. It's that's why I, when I say it's a gradual, that's the gradual I'm talking about. They didn't just do it overnight or they didn't do it over the months or a week period. They gradually just literally chewing up that little bolt, tied up and a tied up, tied eventually come to breaking point. So this connection between inside and outside of Xinjiang was the biggest cut for us. And we no longer talking to our families, which means pretty much we felt we cut off from our rules. And um, average people, randomly if you pick and choose, someone disconnected with their own family, it's roughly about two and a half to three years. I personally, I lost contact with my family April 2017. So many people, that's average. And it's some people who even stop talking to or stop communicating with, uh, with their families since 2016. Either their family is taken away or they simply cannot ring anymore. And family asking them to stop ringing them. So this is the kind of, like, um, it, it, it is enormous. It's, um, it's, it, it's a bigger size, a distraction for our communities. And uh, this is the fact one. And fact two, I'm trying to put a little bit of a picture here, is um, it's, there's one thing, and wherever you go, there's legality issues here. And when we start campaigning, we're trying to explain to people what's the legal ramification of holding someone more than 24 hours, more than a week, more than one month in the prison-like uh, system. And that's why when they say, yes, there's a camp, we know people been staying there months and months, even a year. And we knew, we were reporting, even up to two years, no one knows what's happening to them. Family members not allowed to see or do anything. And what the reaction from international communities and how is that possible? And I would say, in that sense, we really much appreciate uh, the, the Adrian Zen, and uh, he did brilliant work and putting all this evidence together at the first and the most important, uh, you know, this estimate of 
850,000 people was in that camp. That was back in 2017, the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. And still that number, as it took three months for international community to accept. Then there's another thing about um, uh, the nature of that, the people taken into camp. They're not only just a randomly taken, they're actually very specifically, very well planned taking people into that camp. And until now, we have over a 400 scholars, legal scholars, all gone. So if you think about, if you want to diminish one society, you will start from the intellectuals. Once the intellectuals go gone, there's no such thing called nourishing. That um, it, society will no longer flourish. That's what's happening to us. We, at the moment, we lost the, uh, 485 scholars, all taken in a camp, a detention centres, as well as prison. Now, latest the addition of one, and we have 60 out of the 485 scholars uh, died, either uh, as a result of torture or at least literally given a desperate sentence. So, once again, it's like that there's a variety of people that, if you can read it, you will get, get to know it. And it's actually pretty much from teachers all the way to writers, scientists, and, um, you know, a bit of like you, you guys as um, journalists and reporters who really can actually hold a pen, make certain influence in the society, all taken. And, um, there's, there's not only about adults we're talking about, there's children as well. We have a family, both adults, all the adults above age of 18 is gone, taken. So what's going to happen with children? And uh, China came up with a brilliant idea called state-run orphanage. At the moment, based on the population are taken in, and based on the numbers of family, uh, separated from children, adults from children, we have nearly half a million children are taken in. And, um, and other than that, and I quickly go through this, and lots of missing people, and because its numbers are so unpredictable, we cannot pinpoint out how many people actually went missing. Um, we don't know the numbers. We don't know how many people died in the camp. And all speculation going on at the moment. So we only know people, the numbers of people taken, but we don't know how many died already. But there is a very few information actually leaking out inside of, um, you know, from Xinjiang, from different places. I say, yes, um, my dad passed away, or my sister did this and this. Uh, this is all this very small amount of data we're talking about, and very small evidence. And uh, the other thing I really want to do is talk about is um, this DNA ID database that China created for us. And we've been forced, every Uyghur family, and um, like every single person, asked to, uh, you know, create, you know, the go that this is not voluntary, involuntary, um, contributed DNA database since 2016, end of 2016, until recently. They created that database. So based on that database, there also has this artificial intelligence, face recognition software. So they can track every one of us where we are. So this is massive surveillance we're talking about. It's not average surveillance, but we're looking at on the streets. This is actually, it's integrated into our DNA. So this is not average surveillance. So I would like to everyone to pay attention to that. But then they're expanding this technology to different countries at the moment. And the other factor is we talk over again and again this is religious persecution and cultural persecution. When you look at uh, the scale and the progression of the current persecution, it is no longer religious or cultural persecution anymore. It's systemic. They uprooted 
every single family, every one of the families is actually either dismantled or separated or um, uh, disrupted. So when you think about any society, when a family is gone, the family is a little seal of that society. The community will be gone. When community is gone, that society will be gone. So therefore, the Uyghur, the identity based that community no longer exists. Or it takes many, many years if there's a, we have a chance, if we want to recover, to come back to normal again. Um, there's another final point I would like to talk to you about. Um, so, so what's that mean to international community? What's happening to us? It's actually affecting internationally at the moment. I and mean, we are doing quite decent some studies on um, how how do we see how do we see the scale of this this whole mass uh, detention? At the moment, based the trend, based the development is China allowing people to leave the camp unless they sign to work state owned um, factories for there's no such simple payment, which is actually 21st century free of the slavery system. So they're allowed to leave the camp but go to sign into that factory. They stay in a factory. Monday to Friday, sometimes the information will be so far collected. They leave, eat, sleep in the factory, they work in the factory. If you're good enough, you're allowed to go home on the weekend, see your family and coming back again. And there's no such thing called salary, salary involved. And then we also come up with another set of research at the moment. We're doing this data collection. Who is actually buying that product? Who is actually getting the benefit? You may not know. Um, our current research shows as quite vast international companies, actually their chain end up in that state of factories inside of China. And uh, we recently we come up with a list of the IT companies, roughly about 36 IT companies who actually register different parts of the world, as well as in Australia, actually has engagement with inside China with those uh, factories. And some of the fact, uh, these IT companies, they even actually help them to establish and maintain the database and uh, creating whole um, surveillance system, even the camera. Some of the cameras actually technologies provided by Australian um, IT companies. And those things were going to the pulling up. And we ask the international business community to take a note that are you still going to use slave labor in the 21st century? Are you happy to go back to the 19th century or even the 18th century? Go back to that slave and labor um, orientated economy. And then we are getting some win win situation here. And some of the factories and some of the business actually start cutting their connection with the China, the cleaning out, and as well as they no longer buy, be part of that chain anymore. And as well as they're really looking into the investment um, as well as um, the, the production line how much actually China involved in that production line. And we even, um, some fashion uh, brands like, uh, you may know here, it's called Gap, H&M, Adidas, um, and sports, a couple of other uh, sports wear, and as well as for over 21, this women in fashion. So what, list goes on. They all have the chain inside Xinjiang, as long as they actually utilize or use um, just a slave labor in their factory. And even hens, if anyone wants to buy hens and kitchen or even tin soup, you never know that probably made in the, that um, you know, the slave labor the factories. So when you buy things in the, in the near future, please watch out where it's produced and who's, which you know, chain line, actually who's, who produced. So we are actually really putting out these messages to all the business companies um, internationally, letting them see, are you going to contribute continuously Chinese way of you know, 
mass destruction in a way, and as well as 21st century and largest atrocity and systemic genocide of Uyghur and other Muslim communities. Thank you.